So I'm delighted to have Lewis Raven Wallace here to talk about uh, his book uh, with our class, our incoming class at the Newmark J School, but also with the world. Uh, so for the world's sake, the book is a view from somewhere. It is excellent. Uh, it is a um, provocative uh, challenge to the shibboleth of objectivity in journalism. And um, I happen to agree with Lewis on this. We'll both be shot at dawn at the, against the wall of journalism school, some of them at least, but we're not there anyway, so we're safe. And um, so, uh, Lewis, thank you so much for doing this. I really appreciate this. Thank you for having me. It's great to be talking to students. Um, and of course, the backstory here is uh, you telling the story of having been fired from your job because you wrote a blog post in uh, 2017. Uh, questioning objectivity, or in fact saying that it was dead and you're okay with it. And um, the blog post, to my mind, the blog post was very smart and not a big deal. When you, you, you said things like neutrality is impossible, um, uh, the editorial decisions matter, of course we still tell truth, uh, journalists should fight back, and we need a sense of purpose. These were some of the points that you made, which I think were all not just defensible, but, but wise. Uh, what was the, did you, did you anticipate the reaction to that blog post? I mean, to the ex extent of losing your job? No, I, I didn't anticipate that kind of a reaction. I mean, these critiques of objectivity go back so far and are so kind of common among journalists. And I would say, especially among um, marginalized, you know, journalists from marginalized communities, um, queer and trans people, people of color, particularly black journalists have been raising these critiques of this idea of objectivity and how it actually uh, ends up being defense of a norm or defense of the status quo or the mainstream, uh, more so than something that, than some abstract ideal to which we can all aspire in the same way and objectivity has often been weaponized against journalists of color and queer and trans people. I didn't think any of that was so controversial to bring up at that time and and what was interesting of course in early 2017 was that journalists in newsrooms all over the place were trying to figure out what it meant to stand up to the Trump administration and to the administration's real distaste for the truth and uh, distaste for sort of good faith conversations about the facts. Um, and so to me, the objectivity island that journalists are sort of swimming towards was like a losing battle in that context because all you have to do is say liberal bias and the conversation is over. And I think for journalists to be able to claim what we stand for and claim our values actually puts us in a stronger position vis-a-vis -vis authoritarian actors and uh, people who want to take away free speech. So yes, I was surprised that I was ultimately fired over that blog post. I think a lot of the people that I worked with in public media um, agreed with me, but were afraid to say anything because they feared for their jobs. And I think it's a, an extremely poor reflection on the work environment <laughs> uh, that I was in, in terms of freedom of expression for reporters ourselves and sort of having the discussions that I think we really need to be having about the fact that our you know, country is run currently by a white supremacist. Um, agreed. So let's go to the other side of it. Uh, and you, and you touched this in the book, but I wonder if you could, if you could uh, review this, if not objective, uh, objectivity, what is our North star? What are our North stars? What's our, what's our, our, uh, bunch of them? Um, what are the principles that you would advise to journalism students to guide their work? I think, that's a beautiful question and it's one that I think of as in a sense kind of a collective question. Uh, I have some of my own thoughts and ideas that are you know not new they include um, and there's been really a shift among a lot of journalists toward transparency uh, as opposed to claiming to be neutral or claiming to be unbiased. We're just transparent about who we are and where we're coming from so that's one that I certainly think is good. Um, a uh, key value for me is curiosity. Um, 
And then I think a key value for me is anti-racism and an anti-oppression analysis and kind of constantly pursuing and shifting uh, my analysis of power and how power is operating as sort of a part of my journalistic ethics. So being really aware of the power dynamics between me as a journalist and the people that I may report on, uh, me as a white person reporting on communities of color and so on. And I think that's the uh, that's the stuff that ends up really, you know, kind of conflicting with traditional ideas of objectivity um, that have assumed a white cisgender male sort of norm. And so those ideas are really uh, troubled by an idea that we would, you know, really talk about power and talk about um, the real power differentials in, you know, a white journalist versus a journalist of color reporting on race, for example. Um, white people are assumed to be neutral in that context. And what I'm really pushing for is to sort of flip that, right? And say, uh, white folks are particularly not neutral around race. Um, we have a lot of biases to unpack and so on. And so to me, that power analysis piece is, I think, a big part of where journalistic ethics needs to move towards. And that's not at all a neutral approach, nor is it an easy one to sort of turn into a simple set of policies or procedures, right? Because the way power operates is always shifting. We have to kind of update our files uh, all of the time as definitions of race shift and under, you know, and sort of who has power in this country and globally shifts and has shifted even in my lifetime. Um, so those are some of the values that I aspire to and try to hold on to. You know, I certainly know journalists who, uh, really place at the center of their work a kind of do no harm or harm reduction approach. Uh, Cynthia Greenlee has a great article out recently in The Nation about that for photojournalists covering um, Black Lives Matter protests. Uh, but yeah, I, I want to be in conversation about that as much as possible about what are these, you know, post-objective ethics um, that, <laughs> that we require. And uh, I really think they need to be sort of worked on collectively and constantly updated and, um, you know, as much as possible centered around liberation and freedom, you know, for all people. Yeah, and we, we'll add to that the obvious litany of things like accuracy, um, uh, fairness, so that, that requires definition and, and so on. I, I had the honor last week of interviewing uh, Nicole Hannah-Jones, who was a hero of mine in journalism, and, and, and tried to probe the question of what reparative journalism looks like. Mm. Which is what she really kind of head to, that that she demonstrated in covering education. She was really covering segregation and equity through that, but education through that lens. What does it look like to cover employment and the economy and culture and health um, uh, and government and, and politics and so on from a reparative lens, from um, that that question of power? And we've always said in journalism that we're uh, for the little guy. Uh, against the man, to use sexist terms there, um, and and that we care about justice and we care about uh, uh, bringing people's stories out. But I think if we really mean that, that's where your discussion about power goes. So let me push it to the next level, the next uh, heresy that that you and I probably uh, agree on, but but uh, offend others, is activism, uh, advocacy, and then partisanship. And, and you have different things to say about each of those. We start, I had the honor too of helping to start the, uh, the social journalism, uh, engagement journalism program we have at Newmark, where we push this question all the time because we start not with content, but with communities, with observing, listening to, understanding, reflecting communities before we can judge the journalism we bring to them. And that journalism is about them help, helping them meet their goals. So that starts to sound like advocacy or, or activism. Do you see any lines there? Do you see any problems there? How do you view that question? So it was actually Nicole Hannah-Jones who said on my podcast, all journalism is activism. Mm -hmm. <laughs> she was a guest uh, on our the third episode, I believe, of the podcast. Um, and 
I agree with her completely. And, and she followed that up by saying, and I'm paraphrasing here, um, by saying, you know, just some of it is activism for the status quo. So I think in some ways that's the purportedly objective or purportedly neutral journalism, right? Is like journalism that avoids suggesting that anything is wrong here, that something should be different. So that ends up being a form of advocacy for the status quo, just like this is the way it is. Um, and obviously a lot of journalism like hers and many others, you know, and again, especially black women journalists have been really strong in sort of claiming um, their values and doing uh, the work of advocacy through their journalism openly. And that's always been necessary for people who are part of communities that have been denied platforms, right? Like we need to do activism just to have a platform. Um, transgender people are a really good example of that. You know, we, we weren't believed about who we were and uh, who we said we were and what we said we were experiencing um, in just, the simplest of ways uh, for a really, really long time. And it's only through activism to have a platform and to have a voice that uh, we've come to a place where there can be such a person as me, right? A transgender journalist um, that would never have happened without activism. And so to me, uh, voice, platform, access to storytelling, all of that is related in some way to activism and it, it's not really uh, separable. And if you think that you're not standing for anything in particular in your journalism work, uh, that's because you haven't looked critically at what you are standing for. And I just think there's no way around that. That said, I, you know, I've worked as a daily news journalist for many years. And of course, I know that conflicts of interest are, are real. <laughs> um, and I've even done, you know, somewhat extreme things like there was a local ballot issue that I didn't vote on when I was covering it, not because I didn't want to, the appearance of bias or any of that kind of crap that I rail against in my book, you know, um, but because I genuinely felt like I needed to focus on the really valid arguments on both sides of that particular local ballot issue. And I couldn't really do that. I knew in myself that I couldn't really do that if I sort of picked a side on that particular thing because then I would start to come up with arguments just for that side because I'm really, really good at that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I like making an argument for whatever the thing is, you know? Um, and so I think that's very real and a real consideration for journalists. And, you know, I think where it becomes really, really, really silly is we have, you know, these uh, organizations that have policies that say like, you can't vote and stuff like that. And that, you know, that's so ridiculous because that's so personal. Um, lots and lots of people could have voted on that ballot issue and covered it fairly at the same time. And I just knew for myself that I couldn't do that. And so um, I do think that, yeah, there's such a thing as conflicts of interest and that uh, all that we can bring to that as reporters is like a real deep kind of self-awareness and uh, realness about what do we think we can cover and what do we think we can do fairly and then transparency when we are deeply connected to the issue or when we are aware of a way in which our bias might affect the coverage. Um, but I think that's like a beautiful thing. And um, the more of that that we can do, that sort of vulnerability that we can share as reporters, um, the more that we can potentially connect with our audiences, you know, as real people. Because another one of the problems that journalism has right now, right, is that folks don't trust us. We, we have all these claims of, you know, we're neutral, we're objective, we're unbiased, and we're this and that. And then, of course, we're not. And as soon as they see that, then um, that becomes another point against our trustworthiness. And it's this losing battle, you know. So to instead say, hey, like, I'm just a human being. Here are the things I'm involved with and that I care about. And here's what I learned about this story. You know, here's what I can tell you now. Here's my best effort at the truth. Like that's more vulnerable. It's less authoritative. And I think that that could, can be a really beautiful thing in terms of uh, establishing a sense of relationship to audience. And Nicole Hannah-Jones is an amazing example of somebody who does that without making her stories be about her. You know, it's not some navel gazing thing or an opinion piece. It's just that she says what her stake is in the story. And I think it leads to more trust. You know, people really trust her. You've just said a tremendous amount. And, and, and part of this, I think, too, is that if, when we're not transparent, when we're not honest about who we are, our perspective, um, 
you know, start here, the liberal journalism, right? That, that when we didn't, when we, we as a field were not honest about that, the conservatives said, if I can't trust you to be honest about that, then how can I trust you to be honest about the facts you give me? And we end up in an epistemological war. Um, and so that question of trust does start with us. Related to that, on, on kind of a more positive vein, uh, exactly part of that, it, I think the most persuasive part of your book was that um, we are, and I'm quoting here, implicated in the stories we tell. And the con connection and closeness gets us closer to the truth. And uh, the head of our uh, equity initiatives at the school, Jenny Choi, argues persuasively that probably the greatest value we have at Newmark, because we have such a wonderfully diverse student body, is the lived experience of our students and what they bring to journalism. And we've got to do a better job, I think, of figuring out how we bring that out and how, we, and how they know how to use that appropriately. Um, so I'm, I'm really interested in that question of how experience can become expertise, how the fact that you have lived something means you bring something to that. Again, with the transparency of saying that this is personal, this is what you bring to it, with the intellectual honesty of being willing to report those things that don't necessarily comport with that worldview. Uh, but, but let's just talk, I, I'd love to hear you talk for a minute about the value of lived experience in journalism. Yeah, I mean, I can probably best talk about that from my own lived experience. Um, as a transgender person, uh, I remember being a young trans activist and um, journalists approaching the you know groups I was part of and stuff. And we wouldn't talk to them because our community had been so disparaged, so misrepresented, so talked down to um, that we were afraid. We had no reason to trust a newspaper or magazine reporter or someone who said, you know, we want to do this story about you. Um, and that, and for me at that time, there was no such thing as a transgender news reporter, you know, that there might have been out there in the world. Um, but in Michigan in the late 1990s, I, I just didn't know of such a thing. You know, I mean, I, I could count on one hand just the other transgender people that I knew, right? Yeah. <laughs> and on the other hand, the number that I'd seen in media. Um, and who are fictional for the most part. Um, <laughs> so uh, there was no reason to have that kind of trust. And so that, that's one piece where uh, lived experience and community connection really and truly matters a lot. Like I think still to this day that cisgender people have no idea what the conversations are that transgender people have without them there <laughs> and how deep the distrust is, you know, still. Um, for trans people, for a lot of trans people of uh, kind of the way that we are seen and the way that we are depicted. And that's been changing a lot recently in more mainstream media venues. Uh, but I think it's still very true that it's been uh, work that's produced by trans people for the most part that's shifted the needle. Um, and it's been, you know, fairly oppositional almost the entire time, you know, like this push for they, they and them pronouns, or even just to, to be called by our names and our pronouns, you know, it's something that we put, had to push for uh, oppositionally and with a lot of pushback for so, so long that it just um, depleted, depletes that uh, trust. And so when the cisgender journalist sort of comes into that community or comes into that world, without that information or uh, without that background without that experience and connection um it can be very confusing for them and they can get things wrong that happens a lot and then when they do people are really angry and then they're confused about the anger um and none of that is confusing to me and i think you know i i get all that and i've had trans people be angry at me <laughs> over like coverage that i've done right but like my lived experience really helps me understand what that's about and why it's so sensitive, uh, how I'm depicting somebody and how I'm talking about their experience and what questions are rude to ask. I mean, just really rude or tiresome. And um, there's so much, there's so much there, right? That's happening often in conversations that uh, cis people aren't privy to. And I, you know, I'm not a person of color. I think as a white person, there's, 
I know that that's also true, right? In a lot of communities of color, that there are conversations that I'm not privy to. And when I come in and I'm like, oh, what about this? You know, I could be asking a really offensive question and just have no idea and it depletes the trust and it depletes the quality of my reporting. And so that's not to say that like, every trans person is uniquely qualified all of a sudden to be a reporter on every trans issue. Like there's a ton of diversity even within that community. Um, but there's also, or those communities, I should say. Um, but there's also, yeah, connections and experience and assumptions that are uh, really fundamentally different for me as a trans person than, um, than a cisgender reporter and that might just make it easier for me to report those stories. Um, not always, not always, right? Because it's like my lived experience is also about my race and class and about my gender expression as a um, more masculine spectrum person, like all of that. But So um, to, a, to a beginning journalist, uh, give the contrary advice then. It's very interesting what you just said. Um, for a cisgender journalist to come and interview trans people about a story involving them, um, what advice do you have about how to approach people who aren't like you? And that's, that's true across, Lord knows, so many definitions. But um, with that sensitivity that you have, uh, how best should someone approach? Because and, and we hope immediately, as of this week, our students are going to uh, be reaching out to people who are not like them. What's the methodology for, for how to be sensitive and how to do that? Yes, and that's so important because, it, you know, I think in a sense, like everyone is not like us, right? That yeah. every other person that I might talk to is somebody whose experience I really don't know. <laughs> and so I think that's a, a mindset to, to still be in, even as you're like, oh, I might be able to connect with you because of X, Y, or Z. Um, or I might, you know, think that I know something more of your experience, whatever. So the number one piece of advice that I have surrounding, especially marginalized communities that you're not a part of, is Google it. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. You know, if you're like, what does X mean? And you're asking your source that before you've Googled it. Um, that it's a very, very common mistake, <laughs> right? One that I'm sure I've made and that many, many people make around trans issues, you know? It's like, what does, yeah, I'm not even, I, there's too many examples to even think of. Um, like I, uh, I had an editor ask me, what does trans feminine mean? Um, and it's like, first of all, I'm not a gender educator. Second of all, you can Google that. <laughs> mm -hmm. um and so and that's yeah that's my number one piece of advice is like do your homework. homework and that counts i mean that counts not just around marginalized communities but around anybody really that you're interviewing you know i mean if somebody like calls me up and they want to talk to me about uh my book but they don't know what it's about right <laughs> read the damn um, book <laughs> then it feels a little bit like that person is wasting my time right because i wrote a whole book about it um and that's sort of i think there are parallels there with like it, life experience right like i've spent my whole life you know talk, or not my whole life but more than half my life at this point talking about transgender issues you know publicly and there's a lot of very googleable information out there that um I'm not at all offended by personal questions, um, but I, I'm, I'm offended usually by Googleable questions. So that's my. <laughs> I like that a lot. I like that a lot. Um, so now you have a podcast. Now you uh, have the book. You are an independent journalist in all kinds of ways. You were a community organizer, come journalist, come independent journalist. I'm curious about a few points in your career. Um, first started with the community organization because you, you came in in a program to, to kind of introduce. We believe in social journalism, in engagement journalism, that we have things to learn from community organizers. We're, we're different because we also deliver information and we deliver information under certain standards and we are not their, their uh, leaders uh, in a community necessarily, but we have a relationship to that community and uh, community organizers have various skills in listening to communities, understanding communities. So what did you bring to journalism first from that world? Um, 
one of the most important things I would say that I got and continue to get from being in movement work is a sense of collectivity, uh, a sense of everything that I do being sort of beyond me as an individual, that in some way I'm accountable to a larger community and a larger set of values. And that was ingrained in me from just being in, in the movement, you know, being in the trans and queer youth movement in the 90s, being in the anti-racist and anti-gentrification and anti-policing movement um, throughout the 2000s and, you know, to this day. Um, and so even in the time period, uh, like when I got fired, um, I had the privilege of knowing that people would support me that a lot of people would support me uh, if I stood up for the values of my community and the movement that I was a part of. And that was true, right? And the people that supported me, unfortunately, were um, not the people for the most part who were really ensconced in the mainstream journalism world because that's a very individualistic world where you're trying to get you know, that next better job and get that next scoop over someone else and um, get the most clicks and shares, you know, all of that, it's, it's competitive. And um, I feel really lucky <laughs> to like not have to attach myself to that kind of individualism. I think that's just such a, a gift that being part of movement really gives you is that ultimately kind of matters more what you contribute as part of this larger thing. Um, and, and you know that people will um, be there for you. And I think that a, a lot of my colleagues in journalism, you know, part of that fear of speaking out and stuff comes from never having been part of a movement uh, where people would uh, speak out alongside you. And what did you have to turn off from that that experience when you came to journalism? What was different? Mm, a, a great many things. I mean, I was really, really surprised, I guess, by how sort of extreme it was when I started in public radio and I'd been community organizing for years. And um, yeah, this idea that you were supposed to set aside your politics and the first station that I worked at was, and I, and I think maybe still is, the kind of place where you can't have a yard sign if you work in admin there, you know? <laughs> like you can't have a yes on Proposition B yard sign or whatever, a bumper sticker. Uh, Obama, you know, 2008. Um, and so it was really a very extreme mindset of kind of setting aside any visible perception of um, political attachments that I didn't fully understand, you know, I, and I, in some ways I still don't. I mean, I, I know that it was about protecting the institution from the perception of bias on the part of its individual uh, actors, but of course, as we've already talked about, that perception of bias is really easy to produce, even from people who don't have yard signs up, right? Like there, because bias is real, and we do bring biases to how we report. Um, and then, yeah, the individualism was was really surprising uh, to me. I mean, there were lots of wonderful and supportive people that I worked with, and you know, my mentor at WBEZ, Lynette Callsness, is like someone who, yeah, wasn't individualistic at all in that way. I mean, just gave and gave and gave to the people that she mentored. And, and but all of that, you know, taking your time to mentor and support people and stuff is like really thankless work in, in a individualistic kind of workplace or environment where the people are getting ahead or the people are thinking about themselves. And that just depresses me in the world of journalism, you know, where um, I think the work that you all are doing is so great because it returns journalism to what it should be about, which is the community and like making things better for all people. And that has to be collective. And we can't, you know, we can't really help with that if we're mostly thinking about ourselves not just as journalists but in general you know and then i think this sort of politicization like this idea that trans uh that trans advocacy was more political than 
joining the PTA or what have you. Um, mm -hmm. That was really shocking to me because it's just like, that's just my life, you know? I, I, I haven't ever had a choice between trans advocacy and like living. And so um, the division of those things to me felt very oppressive and repressive. But initially I was like, okay, fine, whatever. This is just a temporary thing, you know? And then five years later, there I am getting fired because apparently I couldn't really tolerate that. But <laughs> let me ask a question a different way too. Um, uh, because that's, you just spoke about the reality of what you had to give up. Uh, another way to put the question is what the difference is between the job titles. And th there are certain uh, outcomes. I, mean, I asked Nicole about this, whether she's an educator, because educators care about outcomes, right? A community organizer is convincing people of things, bringing them together, uh, going for action. A journalist is not doing all of those things. A journalist is, doing, is adding value in other ways. So I guess I'm, I'm, I also want to ask you, um, uh, because I think we need to be a little careful that there is a separation of job um, goals there. And so at, at a more generic level, forgetting about how it's, it's executed at public radio or anywhere, uh, what should the difference be between a community organizer and a journalist? Which is a variant on asking about activists too. So maybe, maybe there's not as much, but, but th I think there are some differences, no? Yeah, that, that's a really great question. I mean, I think I come from a school of thought where there's not that much of a, of a difference, but there are different kinds of community organizers, right? And there are different schools of thought about what community organizers should do. And um, some of those are more about rallying people around a particular sort of vision or set of talking points, you know? Um, I, I guess I come from a... a background and experience of organizing that's very much a sort of pedagogy of the oppressed popular education approach that actually really is about listening and curiosity and drawing out people's experience and then to the extent that you run a campaign or whatever that campaign is motivated entirely by what it is that people need and what's in their uh, hearts and in a sense i think that can be exactly the same as journalism it's about listening and curiosity and figuring out what people need and what's in their hearts and, and conveying that in some way um, those could be very similar roles and you know and there's a whole interesting tradition that that i very much came out of of like media organizing organizing through media you know i just came from the allied media conference where that was started uh, 21 years ago by people who made zines. And 21 years ago, that was me, you know, making zines. And that sort of was my activism, right? Was putting out zines about trans experience and anti-racism and that kind of stuff. And so the media and the activism were, were one and the same. Um, and at Allied Media Conference, that's, you know, thousands of people who that sort of is their approach to activism. So all of that said, you know, there are like political organizers who are running a campaign for a candidate, for example. And that's never the kind of organizing that I've done or been a part of. And I think that is very different from journalism. <laughs> this, is, this is where you say in the book that, that one should not be partisan in that sense. <laughs> yeah, partisanship is, is not really my thing. I mean, I think there's a place for partisan journalism, but I think um, partisanship and curiosity really can come into conflict <laughs> um, and because political parties to me are just like any other sort of institution right they um, they can be very limiting and um, and the same goes for 501c3 nonprofit organizations and community organizations you know um, they all have their agendas yeah they all have and journalism are they all have their agendas mm -hmm. and so I, I really don't think that there's one clear line i really think of it more as like this kind of spectrum but i think it's incredibly incredibly valuable for um journalists to kind of learn the skills of community organizing that that are about uh tapping into sort of grassroots community needs and desires and building relationship. My colleague Alicia Bell from Free Press talks a lot about that, about building relationship. And of course, in theory, that's what journalism is about. And that's what community organizing is about. In practice, they can both not be at all. And I think that's one of the problems that we have in both areas. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
that is the essence of, of, of our social journalism program and the rest of our school as a result is the realization that it is about relationships, it is about communities. Um, slightly different topic, uh, but, but still related. I've been thinking lately about one of the problems with journalism is that we do think, and you use this word in the book, and, and I like this, in binaries. Right? We try to put people in one of two buckets, uh, that you are red or blue, you are 99% or 1%, you're black or white, um, you're one gender or another. And um, uh, so, and, and I think this classification almost comes out of the medium in a sense. It's almost a McLuhan thing. The medium is the message. We, we put you on one piece of paper or another. And the internet blows that apart. The internet enables people to define themselves and find others who they feel are like them and then assemble and act as a community, right? And that, that blows apart the effort, whether it's a journalist or a pollster, to put you in a bucket. Um, and it has more nuance. And so I, I, you know, it's like a conference. I don't necessarily have a question so much as that comment, but, but I, I liked what you said in the book about that, that notion of, of binaries. Can you just talk about that for just a moment? Yeah, um, trying to think of even where to start. I mean, I think that that has been a beautiful thing about like my generation. Uh, you know, I'm a millennial <laughs> and I'm an old millennial <laughs> on the old side of millennial. But um, well, I tend to tell students there's no such thing as a millennial. It's an external definition and it's bullshit, but yes, <laughs> right, 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 yeah. Having said that, uh, you are one. Yeah. Speaking as an old millennial, <laughs> um, I, I feel like I've seen, you know, again, the, tr the trans community just sort of bust through this binary framework around gender. Um, and that was a very imaginative act and a very courageous act. I mean, when we started doing that, people were just like, literally, what are you talking about? Like, you're nuts. <laughs> you are, I mean, people would say things to me like, you are, you're making this up this is not real, you know? And it's like, well, right, but we made the whole thing up, gender, you know? <laughs> Everybody's been making it up. <laughs> and so busting through that binary is a, is a powerful imaginative act and a really brave act. And I do think that that's been facilitated by media and specifically by the internet, the, the pace at which that's happened. You know, I think the Black Lives Matter movement is another really wonderful example of, um, a collectivized use of the internet to complicate the story and make the story bigger and break through this really painful and damaging silence about police violence against black people in this country that had just been going and going and going. And it was so routine. It wasn't even being reported in the news. It was just a part of things until Black Lives Matter said, yes. you know, no, we're not having it that way anymore. And that was, young people, that was queer women, you know, leading that, people who just wouldn't have been believed, wouldn't have been listened to using the, these uh, dispersed platforms that they had access to, and then sort of showing the mainstream media, actually, there's a bunch of people who believe us, and there's a bunch of people who want to, you know, hear and tell these stories, and um, making those stories valuable, like making Black Lives Matter in the news, and um, I mean, the list just goes on and on and on of, of ways that people have used the internet to sort of um, bust through silence. But I do think it really, it also busts through the sort of media binary that I think you're bringing up of like, there's either, you know, sort of uh, unbiased regular news, like the New York Times or your local paper or whatever, or there's opinion news. You know, and to me, like Black Lives Matter is news, right? Is making news, is reporting news. And it, it's not about, it, it's a third thing. It's a thing outside of that whole framework, <laughs> you know, because it's not a newspaper, it's not a blog. It's just people like posting videos and being like, this is news. <laughs> it's, it's the voices of people. And that's yeah. what we're supposed to listen to. That's the public conversation. Uh, James Carey, uh, the late Columbia professor says that uh, democracy, a republic, is a conversation, preferably a cacophonous conversation. 
And I think what's happening is that people are not accustomed to hearing democracy. They're accustomed to hearing a very controlled conversation. And now that there's all this noise out there, it, it, it makes a difference. Let me, just a couple more questions and I'll- Yeah, I'll, and people I'll, are like, but how can we tell who's a real journalist? And it's like, when could we ever tell that? You know, there's never been some kind of fair way that who was a real journalist was decided. It just used to be only white men. <laughs> you know and that and so the it's so it feels so disingenuous to me that whole conversation now today about oh we need to worry about this slip and slide into like endless you know partisanship and it's like I don't really think that's what a lot of this is actually about I mean there's issue we have issues with part you know partisan polarization for sure in our mainstream political framework but I think part of what's driving that is uh similar behavior among the political parties as the mainstream journalism organizations have, which is to kind of silence outside voices on at either extreme and silence ambiguity and, and stick mm -hmm. with this sort of speaking against each other and silence nuance and, you know, and then complain about how polarized everything is. <laughs> By making it polarized. Yeah. We, we, right. <laughs> we, we, we um, you know, it's the famous lines from the, the then head of CBS and the still current head of CNN, Donald Trump may be bad for America, but good for my business. Um, uh, conflict became part of the business model. Yeah. So you, so you worked outside the legacy industry, then inside the legacy industry, and now you're outside again. Um, what do you think about the legacy industry, uh, just personally? Uh, can it be um, fixed? Uh, how would you fix it? Uh, what needs to be fixed? Would you ever go back in with that desire or are you happier out? Just how do you, how do you look at that now, having seen both sides? Uh, I think the only place I would go back to, um, at least from where I stand now, uh, is or the place I would most like to go back to is public radio, because I think that the potential remains for public radio to really serve the public. Mm -hmm. And that the airwaves are public, they're free, and they should be owned and run by the community. And I think public radio still holds that promise, even where it's not fulfilling it. Um, and it's, you know, it's always been a not-for-profit enterprise. Like, there's, there's a lot of things I think foundationally, structurally are actually really beautiful there. And that's, like, part of why I worked in that environment for as long as I did. Um, I believe in it. I believe in listener-funded radio that's accountable to local communities. I think that's a brilliant idea <laughs> and one that we should continue to invest in. Um, it's disappointing that the leadership of so many of those organizations has been so uh, racist <laughs> and sexist and destructive to um, people who have worked in those environments. Not every place, but a lot of places. But anyway, that's, a, that's an aspect of legacy media that I really believe in. Um, that said, I I've been thinking just actually just since last week, we had a, a really beautiful gathering of movement journalists during the Allied Media Conference. And folks were talking about the connections between abolitionist organizing and organizing among journalists. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the things that I learned from being part of movements for prison abolition for a long time was how to think about abolitionist reforms versus reformist reforms. So a reformist reform would be like something that tweaks the prison system, right? But, but leaves it intact or maybe even strengthens it in some way. Um, a really good example of a reformist reform is our whole system of probation that was put into place in the uh, 20s and 30s. Um, that probation ends up actually extending the reach of the prison industrial complex further into people's lives. Um, but at the time, it was like, oh, wouldn't it be nice to let people out early? <laughs> like, yeah, that's a, good, that's a reform that's good in the short term. But in the long term, expands the power of that system. And so I've been thinking about asking the same question around legacy media. Um, like if we're dealing with an organization that has deeply entrenched racism and sexism and Me Too accusations and um, exploitation and all this kind of stuff, there's, I'm sure there's ways that we could change and improve that organization, right? But 
are the changes that we're making just like rearranging the deck chairs on the so Titanic. Abol abolish news? That's basically what I'm saying. Yeah, <laughs> that I think some, some of these some of these organizations, it's going to be better to just let them go wow. and not invest any more energy there because um, I think that's a that's a really good lesson of like abolitionism, right? Um, and I mean, you can extend that into yeah into the original abolition and then the abolition of slavery, right? Like there, at a certain point, stuff is rotten and you got to get rid of it. Um, and so I'm not gonna name any names or say that about any specific like organizations here and now, um, but we're in a time of just like remarkable, unbelievable global change and upheaval and where people are talking about, you know, the, about mutual aid and talking about fascism in the United States <laughs> I'm talking about, you know, and so a lot can change and a lot has changed. And unfortunately it's been changing in a direction that's taking us toward um, more uh, authoritarianism and um, less freedom in a lot of ways in this country, not for everybody, because a lot of people haven't been free in the first place, um, but more authoritarianism. And so if, if we can, open our imaginations to that. I think we should be able to open our imaginations to letting go of some of these organizations and ways of organizing news that haven't been serving people for a really, really long time and that and invest those resources elsewhere. And, and you have the opportunity, I mean, you, you're, you're demonstrating this, and we believe in this too, of the resilient independent journalist, each word has its own meanings, but, but, but you're making it on your own, right? You're being supported in your podcast and the book uh, and so on. Uh, and by the way, why don't you plug the addresses of your site and, and the podcast while we're here? Sure. So my podcast is also called The View From Somewhere. And it's at viewfromsomewhere.com. And your personal uh, website is? <laughs> uh, it's the same. It's all one. So okay. viewfromsomewhere.com will just take Lewis you back. Lewis Pants as well. Okay. Yeah. And yeah. Twitter, you're Lewis Pants. Um, oh, yeah. On Twitter, I am at Lewis Pants, and it's Lewis with a W. <laughs> right. um, last question. Uh, as I mentioned to you before we got on the air, um, we have a wonderful, large, and active uh, queer club at the school. And coming from your perspective, having been in the, in the industry, uh, I wonder whether you have any particular advice for students who are starting out uh, based on your lived experience in journalism. Yeah, um, I think I, I almost have like two contradictory pieces of advice. <laughs> One of them, it, it was so valuable for me to kind of humble myself to the process of doing daily news um, mm -hmm. and learning the mechanics of that kind of journalism that can feel like a real grind. Um, and I think it's incredibly valuable to like spend time building up those skills. And that sometimes that means doing something that isn't like fully aligned with our own personal values, because there's not a lot of daily news organizations right now that are kind of radical and community driven in their approach, right? anywhere in the country. There will be, because we're going to build those, but uh, we need to learn how to do news, <laughs> you know, do the news. And so, <laughs> um, so that's like my one piece of advice is just like, it doesn't hurt to just get in the grind and like work in some places where you're not aligned with the values and where you don't, or even where you don't feel you can fully be yourself. And you then learn, my you learn a lot. Yeah. You learn a lot and you might have to work in an, right now, you might have to work in an environment like that to build up those chops. And, you know, so people ask me about like, oh, can I live by my values and work in media? And I'm like, I don't know, man. <laughs> I, I couldn't really, I mean, I got fired, right? But it was really valuable that I did do that work for that period of time to enable the things that I feel able to do now. And then my contradictory other piece of advice is, like it's it's never too uh, early or too late to to do the right thing, right? And to like stand up for uh, 
So it's like, choose your battles on the one hand, but on the other hand, you know, here we are in the middle of a global pandemic, like none of us can afford to um, not stand for liberation or stand for our communities. And it's just that every day throughout our lives, that's always going to look like different forms of compromise and different forms of like navigating systems. Um, and hopefully we're going to change those systems and we're going to build new kinds of institutions that can report the news that people need while not exploiting people and not um, destroying people's lives. <laughs> um, I, I really believe in that, but we need people who are skilled up <laughs> to be able to build those organizations, you know. Good advice. Um, let, me, let me say to the students uh, watching this, we both said radical things. And they're, you're going to find a lot of uh, editors and producers and professors who do not agree with us. The point is to push your thinking. The future of journalism is yours. You've got to decide where your North Star is. You've got to decide the answers to these tough questions. You've got to take this and challenge us as much as you challenge anyone else. But you've got to decide for yourself because it is your personal responsibility. And Louis, I, I can't thank you enough for this. I know you're, you're busy and um, uh, on call, but I'm, I'm grateful you'd come to talk to Newmark. I want to, for all the, those outside, because the students have all read the book, but for those who are outside, the book is very good, uh, The View from Somewhere. Um, it's out now. Go get it. And uh, Louis, thank you so much. Stay thank safe. You.